President Macron has convened us for what has been dubbed as the How Dare You Summit. And for sure, I think we have confronted financial orthodoxy. We have confronted shareholder power, global capitalism, and corporate power. And we have also had a conversation about big oil. Madam Lorenz Tobiana spoke about breaking taboos. Prime Minister Mia Motley reminded us that this is not a formal decision-making forum, but a pivotal moment to set aside our national interest and end the perpetual blame game. I want to repeat here again, as I did before, this is not about North versus South. It is not about uh, emitters or non-emitters. It's not about the rich versus poor, climate guilty or innocent, and the powerful or the powerless. It's about all of us, big and small. It's about us in our diversity. And it's about crafting a win-win outcome. These are the benchmarks we have established for ourselves. They will serve us as a criteria against which we must assess our agreement. We have agreed that no country should be forced to choose between eradicating poverty and preserving the climate. We have agreed on some additional resources to support the vulnerable and the poorer countries. We have advanced discussion on reforming the governance of the multilateral development banks. We have progressed the conversation on a new global source for financing uh, for climate and the mechanisms that can be put together to insulate us from national interest and global power structure whose decision-making processes include all of us and not just a few shareholders. We are agreeing that for the first time, as we leave Paris, um, President Macron, and you have been incredible. You have run this like Kenyans would do. You have run it like a marathon. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this was not a, a session to coerce anybody to do anything different from, it was, it was a meeting of minds to try and bring consensus the same way we managed to forge a consensus in 2015 is to try and eliminate the tensions that have informed the journey to where we are today and to see whether we can recreate the consensus that had been built um, in mobilizing the world towards dealing with the challenge of climate change and international financing architecture. Um, this was not a, a session to discuss although all of us are signatories to the UN Charter that respects independence of countries, uh, boundaries of countries. We are all believers in that, and that is why my colleagues from the African continent went to Kiev, went to St. Petersburg, because we believe there can be a peaceful resolution of all conflicts, including those in our continent, in Sudan, in DRC, in Somalia, there is always a way that we can resolve this in a peaceful manner. Our concern, uh, at least those of us from the uh, global south and especially in Africa, is the effects the war is having on commodity prices, fertilizer, grain. That, that's really impacting very negatively on the cost of living. It's also raising concerns to us because, because of the challenge of energy, uh, Russia having done whatever they did, many countries are going back to fossil fuel. You know, uh, the examples are out there. Uh, we're getting reports that maybe the UK is going to switch on their coal plants. I think that's not good for what we are trying to deal with. It's not good for the challenge we are, we are faced with, the existential threat that faces humanity. The moment we engage the reverse gear about the things that we had done and uh, we thought we were making progress, it concerns not just us, but I'm sure it concerns humanity. The ultimate judgment of our success does not rest in our arms. In the coming days, the world will pass the verdict on us. 
But I must say, having part, being part of this conference, we have made tremendous progress. I would have preferred to see a firm commitment built or building on the G20 debt suspension initiative to deploy a portion of the new development finance sought to provide greater fiscal space for heavily indebted countries by refinancing their maturing debts on more favorable and extended terms. Many of our countries lack the necessary fiscal room to take on additional debt. And we are saying this, it, as we discuss this new uh, financing system, we value the incredible support by the multilateral development institutions, World Bank and IMF. We also have a wonderful relationship with China. They finance our infrastructure development. The tension between the West and China is unhelpful, is unnecessary, and is as useless as the tension between the North and South when we discuss climate change. That is not necessary. We must find the formula that will bring all our financing to respond to three issues, urgency, scale, and to make it much more affordable. That is the conversation that we want to have. And hopefully, we have laid the seeds of that conversation to happen. Again, thank you, President Macron, for making it possible for China to sit here and for the West to sit here, and those of us from the African continent to be in the equation. We don't take it for granted. Let me mention three straight things. Number one, we are bringing our ideas. We've had a very honest but candid conversation around the table. We've had others, but we've, they've also listened to us because we believe that uh, we do not want anymore to be a continent where people complain, where we are victims, where we are the corner. We, we believe that Africa can step forward in a very proud way to work with the rest of the world on the challenges we have and provide solutions. We agree, for example, with the suggestions that it could be difficult, maybe nations, maybe when we talk about national interests, how do you uh, enforce carbon tax? How do you en enforce shipping tax? How do you deal with financial transaction tax? I mean, they are legitimate concerns. But I dare say those who met in that little room in Bretton Wood had as difficult choices to make as we have today. But they didn't walk away from it. They forged a consensus. I think in the world we live in today, there is a lot more creativity. There is a lot more innovation. Technology can give us the opportunity to levy this tax, raise the resources, and be able to give as many, including the third issue I want to say what Africa is bringing. We are the continent with the largest renewable energy reserves, whether it is wind, solar, geothermal, hydro. How are we going to raise the resources to unlock the huge potential in our continent? It is by having this kind of candid conversation. It is by bringing our ideas on how we can be creative, how we can be innovative, how we can leverage on technology so that we can raise the requisite resources to unlock the hinder dam that is giving us uh, nightmares, which can provide electricity to 15 countries. We still have 600 million Africans who do not have access to electricity. 900 of them without access, 900 million of them without access to clean cooking uh, energy. We need the scale of the resources that we are discussing and the, to democratize the raising of those resources so that it becomes a lot more easier to make decisions going into the future. 
So finally, let me say, Africa is coming with ideas. We are coming with our resources. We have the largest um, renewable energy resources. Two thirds of the world's arable, um, uh, uncultivated arable land is in our continent. We have the youngest population in the continent. These are assets that Africa is coming to the table with so that we can provide an outcome that is win-win contributed by everybody. We have agreed that we have to rethink. We are in a new normal. The new normal that came through the pandemic into the Ukraine-Russia war, into the vagaries and what climate change is doing to us. Floods, cyclones, uh, droughts, and, and, and the, the threat to humanity that we see. This new normal requires a new approach. We're all clear that up to 52 countries are facing debt uh, distress. I listened to my sister, Kristalina, and you know, Kristalina, we have a wonderful relationship. You have been immensely supportive of Kenya. But looking at this context and listening to the discussion about the SDR, the allocation, the reallocation, the application, the verification, the assessment, the next, I get a headache. <laughs> Honestly, I sincerely think that there is a much more creative way of dealing with this. The same way we did it during COVID. There is a way we can do this so that those in distress, the 52 countries to start with, how do we make it possible for them? Since they are already assessed for the debts they owe, how do we make them enjoy the benefit of a pause or reschedule or um, whatever you want to call it so that they can have immediate liquidity and create space for themselves. That is a conversation that I think uh, we should have. And let me say, this will move us closer to addressing the crisis that we have today on matters liquidity. We have also had a conversation and progressed one on a new global sources of financing for climate action and mechanisms that can be better insulated from national interest. This will move us close to addressing the climate crisis as a global common good, as opposed to something that we have to play a balancing act with the national interest on one end and do this uh, at scale. So we can do this at scale, agency, and which our as if our existence depend on it. Let me, let me clarify. Um, Emmanuel, you've been immensely, I mean, speaking to you as a member of the G7, you have been immensely accommodative of the, all the divergent views that have come on the floor and in all the fora that we have enjoyed ourselves in, here. We are saying we want this time around a mechanism that involves everybody, where nobody, where we are all paying, where we are all involved, and where we all decide. Because climate change is not about the North or the South. It's about all of us. And the discussion about carbon tax is a discussion that is a must have. And on this one, we do not want the North to pay for the South. We want all of us to pay. Whether it is aviation tax, whether it is uh, fuel tax, whether it is shipping tax, we want to pay because we want to be on the table. The conversation about who has not paid what is very energy sapping. It is very tiring. We want to have a different conversation. And I am very happy that that conversation has begun in Paris. And thank you, President Macron, for making it possible for this conversation to happen. We have some time between now and the Africa Climate Summit in Nairobi 
on the, between the 4th and the 6th of September. That is co-hosted by the Africa Union, and I was told by the chairman of the Africa Union who was here with us, the Africa Union Commission, to invite none other than President Macron. You will be a keynote speaker. We want you to carry the gains we have made here to Nairobi, onward to UN General Assembly, and finally to COP28. The progress that has been made here is immense. Let me uh, tell you, uh, President Macron, I know you said yourself that there is some work to be done. Yes, there is some work to be done. But we have plenty of time between now and Nairobi. We have like three months. As I told you yesterday, um, the UN Charter was negotiated in two months. I also said that the Bretton Woods Institution where Kristalina and Ajay are working, they were negotiated in a little village, a little town called Bretton Wood in 1945. In three weeks, we have a lot of time between here and uh, Nairobi, and between Nairobi and COP28, we can fix this, and it can happen for all of us. Thank you very much.